Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Alex Debs, an associate professor of political science and a research fellow at the Macmillan Center. His work focuses on the causes of war, nuclear proliferation, and democratization, and his work has been featured in numerous scholarly publications. Today we'll talk with Professor Debs about the new book he co-wrote with Nuno Monteiro titled Nuclear Politics, The Strategic Causes of Proliferation. Welcome, Professor Debs. Good to be with you. Well, your book comes at the perfect time, especially with all of the news about North Korea and Iran. Um, so let's get right down to it. Tell us about your book. Well, what the book does is it, it looks at the history of nuclear proliferation and um, considers the causes of proliferation, why are states interested in acquiring a nuclear weapon, and which states are successful in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. And so the book offers a theory of the causes of proliferation and reviews the diplomatic history uh, between the states that are considering acquiring nuclear weapons and other concerned states, enemies and allies alike. Okay. And what led you to write the book? Well, if we look at other explanations of uh, nuclear proliferation, um, intuitively, the security angle would be the most compelling. Nuclear weapons are, after all, weapons. Mm -hmm. But people who have taken that approach have only looked at the interests of states that want to acquire nuclear weapons. And that's led to o an overprediction of proliferation. Okay. Too many states would be interested in getting them, and too few get them. And so we were interested in understanding how we can solve that puzzle uh, and how we can understand which states are successful in, in acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, and in the process of doing the research, we amassed a lot of information. Much of it is available digitally um, with, uh, for example, the diplomatic archives of the foreign relations of the United States being okay. available online. And it became clear to us that this needed to be in the form of a book as opposed to small articles. Okay. And, and how did you do the, the research for it in addition to what you just said? Yeah, so we did the research. It was a dialogue between theory and evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to break down the problem into small parts. So first looking at relations between potential proliferators and their enemies and understanding when states are successful at getting weapons and then adding a third, another dimension, which is the role of allies. In many cases, for example, the U.S. is involved in many security commitments and some states, even though they have security commitments from the U.S., have at various points considered getting nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. But once we have the baseline of states without uh, security allies, we can understand the effect of alliances. Um, and that's how we broke down the theoretical problem. And in terms of the evidence, as I said, there's a lot that's available um, both digital, digitally um, on, from the web, but also from archives and secondary sources. And so we uh, analyzed that data to try to see what were states' leaders thinking in the pros and cons of getting nuclear mm -hmm. weapons, and, and then went back to the blackboard and revised the theory accordingly. Okay. Um, and despite what we hear in the news today, particularly about North Korea, not very many countries have nuclear weapons. Why is that? Well, that's one of the puzzles that motivated our, our, our theory. Um, and we seem to be very concerned about proliferation, but that's one of the paradoxes of mm -hmm. proliferation, that not many countries have nuclear weapons. So should we worry about it? Should we not worry about it? Well, let me ask yes. you this. They don't have them, but do they want them? Some definitely want them, and others probably not so much? Right. So, I mean, if we look back, uh, we're currently worried about North Korea, which has mm -hmm. proven its capability of having nuclear weapons. But if we rewind a few years back, before that it was Iran, before that it was Iraq. So mm -hmm. there were states that expressed an interest in getting nuclear weapons. And often we talk of nuclear weapons as, as the weapons of the weak. So mm -hmm. if a state would lose a conventional war, it would greatly benefit from acquiring nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And so there is documented evidence of state leaders being interested in getting nuclear weapons. Um, but very few are actually successful in acquiring them. And why is that? So for us, it's that um, there are unique circumstances where a state is both interested in getting nuclear weapons and able to get them. Mm -hmm. So in short, nuclear weapons are weapons of the weak, but the weak can't get them. So the same reason that a state... But why can't they get them? Because of the actions of other states around them, the enemies and the allies. Mm -hmm. So if we... It, it would seem to me, though, that because it's information that already exists and, and is out there, 
it's so very difficult to figure out how to build a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, there's a technological aspect. So mm -hmm. you need to clear certain hurdles, enriching uranium, having the delivery capabilities, and all these technical problems. And now, certainly, that will mean that certain states that otherwise uh, would have their security needs met by an alliance may say, this would be too costly and I won't consider it. Mm -hmm. But there are many states that do consider it. They do consider there to be a significant security benefit. But in that case, they can be either coerced or reassured by allies that they actually don't need nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So if we look at states, for example, like the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had a clear security need, but it was able to acquire nuclear weapons because the U.S. preventive war plans uh, that, that Washington was considering were, were not workable. The cost would have been too high. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas you have weaker states like Iran, Iraq, and Syria thought at various points of having nuclear weapons, uh, but they were unable to reach to, and clear that threshold. And so a state needs to be strong enough that it can withstand pressures by other states and, and, and get nuclear weapons. When you say strong enough, what do you mean by that? So here, in terms of the measures, we're looking at conventional capabilities. So when we look at conventional capabilities, there's various measures that are being used, but you can look at manpower, uh, um, the size of the armament, size of the military. Um, and so states that uh, have otherwise a very small military may feel that if there is a security need, getting nuclear weapons could be their trump card. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, if they're relatively weak and their enemies have more manpower, military power, these enemies are more successful at using coercive threats and, and preventing those states from getting nuclear weapons. Okay, except in the case of North Korea, for yes. instance. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yes. Um, you know, in fact, give, can you give the trajectory of North Korea and, and how it's come to now have a nuclear weapon? Yes. So North Korea has a clear security need. The Korean War in 1953 ended with an armistice, not a peace treaty. And so technically, North Korea is still at war with the United States. Um, during the Cold War, North Korea had an alliance with the Soviet Union and China, two states that um, provided assistance during the, the Korean War, especially uh, the Chinese. But uh, North Korea came to doubt the reliability of, the, of these alliances. And in the 80s, both the Soviet Union and China wanted to improve their relations with South Korea. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, and so for North Korea, it made sense for them to have their own deterrent. Um, and also looking at their trajectory, both economically and militarily, the, the South Koreans were growing relative to the North Koreans. And so it made sense to have this ultimate trump card. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see a clear security need for having nuclear weapons, but they also had the opportunity to have nuclear weapons. Um, and this is in part because of accidents of geography. So Seoul is very close to the North Korean border, only 30 miles or so from the border. And that's meant that any preventive war plans that the Americans and the South Koreans considered were not very workable. It would have led to very high casualties in South Korea even with North Korean conventional response. Mm -hmm. um, and so Bill Clinton considered preventive war plans and tabled them. The United States came to an agreed framework with North Korea, where North Korea would freeze its program in exchange for economic uh, inducements. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, the US was worried that North Korea was not following through on its commitments. And the North Koreans were worried that the Americans were not quick enough in providing the incentives that they had promised. Mm -hmm. And so in the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, uh, the agreed framework fell apart. North Korea withdrew from the NPT and made its first test in 2006 and its second in 2009. OK, so when we look at North Korea, um, Basically, the last few decades have been a family-run mm -hmm. country. Yes. Um, and it seems to me, contrary to them, not necessarily wanting protection, but wanting to, to, weld, to wield power mm -hmm. over the rest of the world by developing a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into your strategy? Well, I think, th so there's... I mentioned that the, the perspective we follow is one of security. Mm -hmm. So is a state worried about its security? Would there be an advantage in, in having nuclear, nuclear weapons? Other perspectives have focused on this argument um, that's described as one of prestige. So for right. example, uh, states like France 
uh, had a certain perception of their role in the world, and having nuclear weapons was an argument to pursue those interests. Um, I have yet to find a state that's not interested in prestige. So, mm -hmm. so any state would be interested in prestige. Um, and so for us, even though these arguments and these perspectives might be useful, what we wanted to do is restrict ourselves to the security dimension and see how much of the variation we could right. explain in empirical patterns. Okay, so how many countries actually do have nuclear weapons? We're looking at nine current nuclear powers. The U.S., Russia, England, France, China, um, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. Very few, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and how many actually would want them? North Korea. Where does Iran fall? So Iran has had a nuclear program, but now has come to an agreement to freeze its, uh, mm -hmm. its, its capabilities. And so uh, you could think there is an interest. The U.S. Uh, um, intelligence services have, have all concluded that the leadership has never made a decision to acquire nuclear weapons, but obviously other states are skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so th there's, a, there's a latent capability in Iran, yes. Okay. So ultimately, um, in your book, what do you conclude? So what we conclude is um, to best understand proliferation, we need to think about the security dimensions, but not just looking at states interested in getting nuclear weapons, but looking at their relationship with other states potentially concerned, so enemies and allies. And so if we only look at relationship between enemies, as, uh, nuclear weapons are weapons of the weak, but the weak can't get them. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to have enough power, enough conventional power to withstand pressures of your enemies and acquire nuclear weapons. So a state like the Soviet Union was able to get nuclear weapons, but states like Iran, Iran Iraq, and Syria have not been able to. Now, once we know this, we can look at the effect of alliances. Mm -hmm. And here, allies can play two roles. They can reassure potential proliferators, and they can also coerce them in reminding them that they shouldn't try to acquire nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can understand also how these two tools are effective. If uh, you're looking at relatively strong potential proliferators, uh, assurances might be sufficient to prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. And if you're looking at relatively weak potential proliferators, then here a more coercive approach uh, could be successful, mm -hmm. reminding the ally that without, for example, the U.S.'s security guarantees, these states would be too vulnerable and they wouldn't be able to acquire nuclear weapons. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a minute and ask you, what do you think the United States could have done better or should be doing to... Uh, lessen the impact or the situation that is going on with North, North Korea right now? Um, well, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the North Korean situation is particularly tricky because there is no good military option. Mm -hmm. And even folks within the Trump administration have admitted as much by saying if we look at the plans, even with their conventional capabilities, they could inflict very severe damage uh, on, uh, on our allies and our troops uh, stationed in the region. And so I think it is concerning to see um, the administration escalating rhetoric when, in fact, the, the military options are not very good. So I think we might look back and say, in general, the U.S. has been relatively good at preventing proliferation. There are some situations where it's very hard to do it. Uh, but by escalating the risks and maybe running the risk of drawing a wedge between the U.S. and its allies in the region, that could lead to further proliferation. So if South Korea and Japan come to doubt our security guarantees, they may decide at some point that they, re they need their own deterrent. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. experience so far in the region there has been one of success of reassuring these allies that the U.S. would be there and would be a responsible player in that region. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it will be interesting to see how it plays out in the weeks ahead. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you. For more information about Professor Debs and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.